Welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and today we're going to be looking at a subject that I kind of thought about, eh, I don't think I'm going to talk about this. But the more I prayed about it, the more I studied it, the more I said, you know, I do believe that I need to do a message on this. This is very eye-opening. This will be something that hopefully will help you to understand the world in which we live. We live in a very, very, very wicked world. A lot of people don't understand that. But this world is not what it appears to be. When you're a Christian, you begin to understand just how evil the world is. And so today I'm going to talk about something that a lot of people think is so nice and innocent and wonderful. And I hope I don't spoil it for you. But I feel like I need to do this message. I've had several people email me over the years and say, Well, Brother Breaker, would you please do a message on this? And I'll be honest, I didn't know too much about it. So I said, Nah. And I kind of laid it aside a little bit and thought about it. I said, Nah, I don't want to. But then this year, I did a little bit more study. Well, actually, a lot of study on this. And I said, You know what? I think it's time that I need to do a message on this. And we're going to talk about today, Valentine's Day. Now, by the time you see this, if you watch every Sunday, then Valentine's Day has already passed. It's actually Valentine's Day today, 2019, as I do this message. So, uh, But I will be behind as I post it for the Sunday message. <clears throat> so I probably should have done this last week. But I just I was sick a couple weeks ago, and that kind of messed up my schedule. So this will be on Valentine's Day. Now, I talked about... Um, several other holidays before. I have a video on YouTube on Christmas and one about Easter and one about Halloween. So those are the three main holidays that many people celebrate. And I talked about how there's so many pagan practices connected with those holidays and how those holidays come from paganism and they've been Christianized because a certain church has, has uh, from Rome has taken these and tried to make something that was pagan into something that's Christian. Well, is it? As we looked at Christmas, we see there's still a lot of the same pagan practices, like the tree and uh, the Yuletides and, and many of the things that they do in Christmas today. That doesn't come from the Bible. That comes from pagan practices and the worship of Nimrod and Semiramis and things like that. We looked at Easter. We saw how, you know, for a Christian, we think Easter, yeah, resurrection. But what does the world do on Easter? Well, to the world, it's all about bunnies and eggs and things like that, and that's definitely not from the Bible. That comes, again, from Semiramis and the pagan worship of Saturnalia and things like that. Then we looked at Halloween and how it's so pagan in origin and the Druidic pagan uh, teachings, and it's a pagan holiday, and they did evil things, All Spirits Day or whatever they call it. And uh, we looked at how there's so much paganism steeped in these holidays, and yet today we celebrate them. You see, the world is still evil, and the world is turning against God more and more every day, and it's really kind of sad to me to see how the world is doing what it's doing. And the Bible tells us that in the last days, there will be people that depart from the faith. And it warns us about the last days, and how in the last days there'll be a falling away from the truth. And that's here, it's called apostasy. And what are they falling away from? They're falling away from God and the Bible and Christianity, and they're falling back into, in many cases, paganism. And paganism was alive and well way back here. And we're going to see way back here there was a lot of paganism. And so a lot of the practices that, that are practiced in the world today come from ancient paganism. Way back here in the time of Jesus and way before the time of ancient Rome, a lot of paganism has come in to the teaching today. And the world, believe it or not, unfortunately is not getting more Christian. The world is getting more pagan. And it's very sad to me to see people going back to those old ancient pagan rituals that they used to do hundreds if not thousands of years ago. And now people are following and doing those today as well. Let's begin with Exodus chapter 18 and verse 30. Exodus chapter 18 and verse 30 I know this is an Old Testament verse, the Old Testament law, God told the children of Israel, hey, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't go the way of the, the Gentiles that aren't saved and learn what they do. God says, I'm going to give you a law, Jews, that you keep, and it's going to be a holy law, how to live a holy life. Don't be like them because they're unholy. In Leviticus 18.30, God says, Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. 
So God says, look, Israel, don't be like these heathen, these, these pagans that were in the land before you. They defiled it with their evil customs, their sin. Jeremiah 10.2 says, learn not the ways of the heathen. And Jeremiah 10.3 says, for the customs of the people are vain. So God looks at the way that Gentiles did things and their festivals and their feasts and their rituals and God says they're vain, they're evil, they're wicked, they're abomin abominable. There's things that the pagans have done that God says, I hate that. Because that's not the way that God wants things done. And we're going to look at that today. Now what does the Bible say in the New Testament for us? Well, in Romans 12, 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we're not supposed to accept the things of the world and just go along and do everything that the world does. We should always study. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Workmen need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So I've done some study, and I'd like to uh, say I appreciate the brother that, that sent me some of this material as well through email. You know who you are. You've called me, and uh, we've talked, and you've given me some information on this as well, and I appreciate that. So let's look at history. Let's look at Valentine's Day, the origin of it. And then we're going to you know, show some Bible verses as well as we look at this thing called Valentine's Day. And the first thing I want to look at is where does it come from? Where it comes from. And when we look at where it comes from, we say, huh, <laughs> it comes from something that's, that's not great. Where does Valentine's, this idea of Valentine's Day, come from? Well, it comes back to Rome. It comes from Rome. And Rome used to keep a feast, and it was from February 13th through the 15th. But the big day was the 14th. And that's the same as ours is on our calendar. Matter of fact, they worshipped a god whose name was Februata. That's where the word February comes from, from one of the ancient pagan gods. So where does... Valentine's Day come from. The origin traces clear back to ancient Rome. And actually before that, even with the Greeks, and we'll get into that a little bit maybe as well. But the Romans celebrated a holiday on February 13th through the 15th to honor their god Juno. Now I don't even know where to put all this, so I'm just going to have to find space. I know I have a lot of space up there. But they worshipped a god named Juno. This is their goddess. So this was a goddess named Juno. And she was called the Juno Fructifer, Fructifer or the Juno Februata. So I'll write that up here. Februata. Februata. Or the Juno Fructifer. And this was the false goddess. This was actually the queen goddess of the entities that the Romans would have worshipped. And so the Romans worshipped this queen goddess of all of their gods. She was called Juno Fructifer or Juno Februata. Doesn't that look like the word February? Februata? Well, that's where the word February comes from. F-E-B-R-U-A-R-Y. But they have Februata. It's spelled a little differently, but it's the same root. It was also called the Feast of Lupercalia. The Feast of Lupercalia. Lupercalia. This is from the god, the Greek god, Lupercanus also known as Lupercal. Now, that, that word there, Lupe, that's where we get wolf from. And that's, if you know your science, <laughs> if you studied biology and you know how there's a scientific Latin name of all the animals, well, uh, a wolf is Luper, Lupus or Lupus. Yeah, it's Lupus, isn't it? So lup, Luper or Lupus is for wolf. So they, they, they also called it the Feast of Lupercalia, this feast from the 13th to the 15th, in which they honored their god Faunus. So they had a false god named Faunus, F-A-U-N-U-S, Faunus. And so they honored this false god, who was the god of fertility. So the roots of Valentine's Day go clear back to Rome, and we find celebrated during that time a feast dedicated to Lupercal, or Lupercanus, the wolf god. And the love was loving one another with sexual promiscuity, or, or engaging in sexual activities, most of the time fornication. So it's all about fornicating to their false goddess that today we have the month of February named after even, 
and it was worshiping a wolf. Now we'll get to the wolf here a little bit uh, later, uh, I guess in our second point. But let me say that this is where it can be traced back to. Why February 14th? That's dead center in the middle of this feast of the Romans. And as we've seen, Christmas goes clear back to the Romans. December 25th was what? Not the birth of Christ. It was actually the birth of Saturnia or Nimrod. And it goes back to the worship of, of Nimrod. Uh, same with Easter. So the worship is Ishtar, which was Semiramis. So all of these things, they go back to pagan Rome. So what we're going to find today is that Valentine's Day goes clear back to pagan Rome. And it goes back to a fertility festival honoring a false goddess and a false god. A goddess and a god. <laughs> Reminds me of Nimrod and Semiramis. A god and a goddess. So it could be that's who it's talking about. So And, and it's going back to this festival of a wolf. Now, the second thing I want to say, something else about this, not only does it, where does it come from, it's, its origin, we looked at the origin. The origin of this. So now we're going to look at how it comes from a pagan cult. And this is what this, this festival of Lupercalia is. It comes from a cult. All right? It's called the Feast of Lupercalia, a feast to the wolf god, which was really celebrated on the 15th. Usually it was the day after. So you've got this 14th is more of for this woman. But it's all tied together as a feast, but it's three days. So all this ties together, this, this feast. It was the feast of Lupercalia. Okay? To the Greeks, Lupercanus or Lupercalia, the Greek name for that god was guess what? The Greeks called their god, Lupercanus or Lupercal, they called him Pan. The Greeks worshipped a man named Pan. Now who, who is Pan or Pan? The Greek god Pan is a Greek god that is half goat and half human. And it goes around playing the pipes and it's got horns. But it's got cleft feet. It's a goat. It's actually Satan. And what you have here is you have the Greeks worshipping Lupercal or Luper Lupercus, who was known as Pan, the god of light, by the Greeks. The Phoenicians called him Baal, the sun god. Now who do we know who Pan is? The uh, Phoenicians called them Baal. And the Greeks called Pan what? The god of light. The Bible says that the devil is an angel of light. So we know this god here as the name of Lucifer or Satan. So if you put this all together like I've done studying this out, really it's a pagan satanic cult. And these are all satanic rituals and the satanic feasts of the pagans because the pagans were devil worshippers. I know that's not a very popular thing to say today, but that's what they are. So today, we look at Valentine's Day, we go back at where it comes from and we look at what it is. It was satanic in nature. Valentine's Day comes from the worship of Lucifer or Satan. And as we get into this study, look, I'm not going to try to convince you that you should or shouldn't celebrate this holiday, okay? But as we get into this study, we see more and more, it looks like the way they worship back there is the modern way that Satanists worship the devil. And that's what I want to get to. So we've looked at the origin of this cult. And you know, all this stuff is on the internet. You can find it. And you can look this up. Uh, some of the, well see here's a lot of the things that I printed up off of the internet. And one of them was actually from the History Channel. And the History Channel has a lot of this information that I'm giving to you. So this isn't something that I made up or that I pulled out of some book somewhere that no one has ever seen. This is all common knowledge. People know this. And all you have to do is study on it and you'll find it. So we've looked at where it comes from. We've looked at how it's satanic in origin. It's actually a pagan cult of the worship of the God of Light, little g, which would be Lucifer. So it's satanic in nature. Now let's look at the customs the customs that they did when they kept this feast. One source says that when the feast of, of this time came, this, this worship came, that men would sacrifice goats and run around with their skins on. Who worships goats? 
Why, the people that worship goats, that's Lucifer. The worship of goats, well, that's, that's Satanism. Have you ever seen what Baphomet looks like? It looks like a goat. Have you ever been, and I hope not, but if you've ever been to uh, satanic rituals, what do they do? They like to dress up like goats. Hmm, well, that's interesting. So one source that I read said that these men would come and they would sacrifice goats and then run around with their skin on. They'd make little loincloths out of the skin and they run around wearing the skins of goats. That sounds very satanic. Noel Lenski, a historian at the University of Colorado, said the men were drunk. And during this festival, they would line up in long lines in order to have someone punch them or hit them. And, and so they would make a big line and say, hey, punch me. And they felt like that if they could take the punch, then that made them more fertile. It was all about fertility. What does that sound like to you? They're all drunk and they're all dressing up like goats. Well, sounds like a drunken frat party to me that, that people do today. Another source says that the Lupercai, the priest of this Lupercus, would sacrifice goats and dogs. So these pagans, when they celebrated different festivals, they often brought blood sacrifice to their gods. And they would sacrifice goats, and they would sacrifice dogs. In the cave of Luper Lupercal, on Palatine Hill, where the Romans believed that Romulus and Remus were raised by a she-wolf. They clothed themselves, clothed themselves with the skins, and they smeared the blood of the sacrifices on themselves. Then they cut the skins into whips and dipped them in blood and went around whipping the women with these whips, with these thongs made of the skins of the animals, which, which were called in, in, in the, their language, Februa. Februa sounds like February. So picture this in your mind. They're all coming together, these pagans, killing animals, smearing the blood of the animals all over them and dressing, when they were dressed, uh, one source says they were only made little loincloths so they barely covered their private parts with the skins of these animals and then they're going around and they're whipping the women with the, the animals with the blood. The priest believed that the flogging of the woman purified her and guaranteed her fertility and ease of childbirth. So it sounds like to me the women wanted to be whipped. So the women were running to this and said, Oh, whip me, whip me. And the men were saying, Oh, punch me, punch me, and standing in line to get punched. So you've got people drunk and, and, and smeared blood all over themselves and, and, and whipping each other. Man, that almost sounds like S&M, you know, sadism, masochism. And they're covering themselves with blood. Sounds like Satanism. Sounds like to me this was an evil, wicked, pagan beast. And I don't see any other way to say it as a Christian than it was pure Satanism. The pagans worshipped the devil. And this was one of the pagans' feasts in February 13th through the 15th. And the way they worshipped is they killed goats, smeared the blood all over them while they ran around half naked, if not fully naked. I'll tell you here in a minute that there were some that were completely naked. And they're beating each other. And they're dressing up like goats. It sounds very sick. Sounds like a, what you'd see today, people dressed in black leather with whips and doing things like that. Things that aren't right. Next thing I want to say about this is the carnality involved. It was more than just them celebrating their God. Remember, it was about fertility. Why would you want to be fertile? Fertility. You wanted to be a fertile woman because you wanted to have a baby. Because eventually, you would sacrifice your baby to the devil. So it was all about sensuality. It was all about having an orgy or sex, uh, getting together and having sex which the Bible calls fornication. And isn't that what Satanists do when they get together? Now, many, many years ago, I watched something, and I, to this day, it haunts me. I wish I had never watched this. But, you know, I, I don't think I was saved at the time, and my buddy and I, we got together, and, and years ago, you could go down to Blockbuster Video or one of these stores, and they had a video that you could rent called Faces of Death. Man, I don't even I hate to talk about this. I hope nobody will, will look that up. But it was a video, and it was two hours long, and all it was was clips of people who died. And they literally saw them dying on film. 
and one guy gets run over by a bus and he dies. Another person falls out of an airplane and he, he bounces and you, and you literally see the moment when he dies. Two hours of just showing people dying. I don't know how you could rent this. I mean, I, I utterly thought it was disgusting. But one of the things they did on that video was they showed a satanic uh, ritual. And they had a human sacrifice. Now, the person was supposedly already dead. I don't know. But they were showing what they were doing. And sure enough, dressed like goats, half naked, they were doing these things. And to this day, that still haunts me. I wish I'd never watched that. That was disgusting. But I, my mind went back to that when I started studying this. And I said, it sounds just like what these people did. They're dressing up like goats. There's nudity involved. There's sexual uh, misconduct. And it's all about worshiping their false gods. So this festival, this fertility festival, was all about being fertile to make babies. There was another name for this festival. It was called the Feast of Sexual License. <laughs> Woodstock. <laughs> I guess you could say. It was a place where you could come together and you could get together and hook up and do things that, you know, God says you're not supposed to do. Historian Noel Linsky again says many were not only drunk but also naked. And they would run around naked with blood smeared all over them. There's also a matchmaking lottery in which men and women were coupled up together for the duration of the feast. The goddess Juno Fibrata was also the goddess of Phoebus or fever, or love. What is that? Well, that's, why do they say, oh, I'm so in love, I have a fever. Oh, you're so hot when someone is lusting after someone. You know, the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn. Where do these terms come from? Well, you get to burning in your lust. And so this was a festival all about lust, and lustful hearts, and, and, and desiring to have sexual relations with other people, and committing fornication. It wasn't about true love, it was about free love, which is not love at all. It's, it's, uh, it's fornication. That's the only word I know, it's fornication. So they would come together, and now watch this. On February 14th, small pieces of paper were put in a container on which the name of a teenage girl was written. So all the little teenage girls would write their name on a piece of paper. The teen boys would then choose a piece of paper at random. These two would then couple until the festival was over. Yet the festivities included, and this is what they did, erotic games, drinking, nudity, feasts, and parties. So the women, the young ladies, I guess this is what they called the coming out party in the old days, the girls would come together and say, Oh, I'm a teenager and I, I'm a virgin. <laughs> they'll put my name in there. <laughs> and I'll draw somebody. Or they'll draw me. And a young boy would draw her, a teenager. And then for this feast, they all had to stay together. What's going on in the feast? They're getting drunk. They're getting naked. They're making sacrifices to false gods. What do you think's going to happen next? If they're already half naked and they're drunk, they're probably going to fornicate. And they often did, because it was all about fertility. It was all about getting pregnant. The sooner you got pregnant, the sooner you would have a sacrifice to your false god of your first child. Which is what they did. And this, this is disgusting. This is horrible. I hate to talk about these things. But it's real. It's true. These things actually have... People were really that evil. And here we are, thousands of years later, falling back into that same pattern. And celebrating days that they celebrated. Now, hopefully you're not fornicating on Valentine's Day. I hope you're not. You shouldn't be. Hopefully you're not sacrificing animals and smearing blood all over you. So we're not there yet, but if the Lord should tarry, I can surely see how the world could get to that point. And they do the same thing over now that they did back then. Sounds like to me there's a lot of fornication. As I studied this, I was reminded of Israel. Do you remember when Israel, Moses was the one that, that uh, got Israel out of Egypt. But you remember about right here, the Exodus? And when Israel left Egypt, do you remember what they did? They went out in the wilderness for 40 years. And God was giving the Ten Commandments and all these other commandments to Moses. And what did they do? They said, well, I guess our God's forgotten us. So they said, Aaron, build us a calf. And what did they do? They, they worshiped this golden calf. And then in Exodus 32:25, the Bible says, Moses came down, and Moses found them 
And he says they were naked. And they were partying around this false god. Sounds like this feast of Valentine's Day was, or Lupacalia, or whatever you want to call it, sounds almost like that back there. So this probably didn't start with the Romans. It probably started before that with the Greeks, and even probably before that with the Egyptians. And if you believe that book that I've shown you, um, before, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, he's done a lot of work to show that all idol worship comes from an ancient Babylon. So all this comes from Babylonian idol worship and Babylonian uh, evil um, sex practices and, and uh, false gods and things like that. What does the Bible say? Should we do this? Should we get together and lust in our heart after somebody else and just, just hook up with them and, and have sex with them outside of marriage? No! The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. And then again in 2 Timothy 2.22, it says flee youthful lusts. Well, it almost sounds like God knew that this was going on when he wrote the Bible. Because this festival here, it was all about the youth hooking up. The young teenage girls hooking up with the young teenage boys. You know, almost like a college frat party or something like that. Getting drunk. So, is that what the Bible says we should do? Not on your life. Not on your life. You know, there's a guy named Cupid. Have you ever heard of Cupid? This is so interesting. When you study all this and bring this all together, what was Cupid? Well, Cupid's supposedly this guy that has this bow, and he shoots this arrow. And when he shoots this arrow, well, what does it do? Well, it instantly makes you fall in love. Or does it? It makes you fall in lust. And when you come and you and you and you get the arrow shot by Cupid, well, then you just you can't live without that other person. What is that? That's lust. The word Cupid comes from the Latin cupere. C U P E R E. This is the Latin word in which the word Cupid comes from. Do you know what cupere means in Latin? Cupere means desire. So if old Cupid comes along and shoots an arrow while he fills you with desire, what kind of desire? Well, we today, we say, well, he just loved them. No sexual desire to want to fornicate with them, because that's what they did back then. Should we go around and fornicate? The Bible says no. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God shall judge. Let me show you something interesting here. Cupid supposedly was the son of Venus, the Roman goddess of beauty and love. So Cupid is the son of Venus, okay? And Venus was the woman, kind of like Juno was the woman. And Venus is the, is the goddess of love and beauty. All right. Her son was Cupid. In Greek... Okay, this Venus, this would be in, 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 the Romans called her that. So in Rome, she was known as Venus. In, uh, in Greece, guess what she was known as? See, as you study this out, all these gods, the Romans accepted many of the gods of the, of the Greeks. So you, there's a Greek name, there's a Roman name, same god. The god's name, or goddess's name, Venus, in Greece, uh, was Aphrodite. 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 The Greeks say that Aphrodite had a son and his name was Eros. So in Cupid is coming from the Roman name for Eros from Greek. So Cupid is Eros. We have a word in the English language, it's called erotic. When something is sensual and, and, and something is meant to make you have desire, sexual desire, stir up passion in you, we say that's erotic. Where does that come from? Eros, Cupid. You know, Cupid isn't just this, just this innocent person going, boom, now they'll just love each other. He's a devil. He's going around trying to shoot people and fill them full of sexual desire so they go and fornicate and worship a false god. <laughs> I mean, I can't make this up. That's what it is. So Cupid's arrow incites lust, not love, in a person. Intense desire and passion. It's not about love, it's about lust. But today, why we, we put a good package on that old pagan rituals, don't we? While we say, oh, it's not about lust, it's all about love. No, no, this whole thing is all about lust. And yet today we try to say, oh, it's all about love. 
But the real love is the blood of Christ. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus loved us enough, he died for us. He shed his blood on the cross for us. That's where true love is. There's a difference between love and lust. Love says, what can I give this person? Lust says, what can I get from this person? What can I take? And so these old festivals, they were all about how a person could get sexual desires met through fornication and, and living a, a loose lifestyle of, of just a wicked, evil ungodliness as they committed acts of fornication. The next thing I want to say about this is about Valentine's Day is how Catholicism has taken this and tried to repackage it just as it always does. Catholicism, I have told you before, is mixing Christianity with paganism. If you don't believe me, go see my uh, live stream that I did not too long ago about, um, about denominations. And I talk about how in 325 AD, 325 AD, that's when the Catholic Church officially started. And it was a joining together of the Roman Empire with Christianity. And it called itself the Roman Catholic Church. And so what they did is they took all the old Roman practices and they Christianized them. And they tried to change it around. And that's what happened here with this thing called Valentine's Day. And I've got lots of sources here I want to read to you. Because Valentine's Day, have you ever heard Valentine's Day called Saint Valentine's Day? They always put up here this Saint Valentine's Day. Why does it have a saint? Why do they call it Saint Valentine's Day? Well, the Catholics try to saint everybody. They just want all these people to be saints. And let me read you some things here about how Catholicism has come in and taken this old pagan ritual and then tried to make it something Christian. Okay, um, they call it Valentine's Day, but no one knows for sure who Mr. Valentine is. There's actually two or three men named Valentine. So it's still to this day a debate, which Valentine is it? According to one story, Roman Emperor Claudius II imposed a ban on marriages because too many young men were dodging the draft by getting married. Only single men had to enter the army in that time. A Christian, a so-called Christian, a Christian priest named Valentinus was caught performing secret marriages and was sentenced to death. While awaiting execution, he was visited by his young lovers with notes about how much better love is than war. Some think of these love letters as the first Valentines. Valentinus says execution occurred on February 14th in the year 26, 269. So a lot of people say that's why it's called Valentine's Day, because of that. Well, Rome killed them. Another one says, um, another Valentinus was a priest jailed for helping Christians. During his stay, he fell in love with the jailer's daughter and sent her notes signed from your Valentine. He was eventually beheaded and buried in the Via Flaminia. Pope Julius I reportedly built a basilica over his grave. See, all this comes from Catholicism. Uh, in 469 A.D., Pope Galatius declared February 14th a holy day in honor of Valentinus instead of the pagan god Lupernicus. So the Pope in 469 A.D. says, well, we're going to make this Christian, even though that's when they worshipped. We're going to take the same day. We're just going to change the name. How about we just forget it all together? No, no, we can't do that. We've we still got to have the day, so we'll just keep the day. We'll just, from now on, say, uh, we'll celebrate it for this other guy. He also adapted some of the pagan celebrations of love to reflect Christian beliefs. For example, as part of the Juno Februata ritual, instead of pulling girls' names from boxes, both boys and girls chose the names of martyred saints from a box. So it's, it's all this pagan practice. They say, well, let's just change it enough to where it's no longer satanic but yet you're doing some of the same customs that they did. You're just doing it in a different way. So on and on and on, uh, there's a lot more I could read there, but let me go to the next point here. Later, Pope Gellius I, Gellius I, muddled things in the 5th century by combining St. Valentine's Day with Lupercalia to expel the pagan rituals. But the festival was more of a theatrical interpretation of what it once been. Linsky adds, it was a little more of a drunken revel, but the Christians put clothes back on it. That didn't stop it from being a day of fertility and love. So the Catholic Church says, no, you can continue to remember February 14th, 
Just don't do all the things they did. And so people say, okay, we won't get naked, we'll just get drunk. <laughs> and so a lot of people did. And they began to celebrate, oh, we'll celebrate love. But they, they're still using the same date. And they're still using some of the same practices. Let me read you another thing. In AD 494, Pope Gelaeus renamed the festival Juno Fibrata as the Feast of the Purification of the Virgin Mary. Okay, remember I told you they would go around with whips. And they would whip people with the skins. And so they're going around whipping them with the skins. And they're getting the blood all over them. And they say when they were whipped, that's how the woman was purified. And that's how she was now fertile. She got purified by being whipped. So the women wanted to be whipped. Well, the Catholic Church says, well, you know, they talk about being purified. Well, we'll just talk about the purification of the Virgin Mary. So they're using the same exact terms. The date of its observance was later changed from February 14th to 12th, or to the 2nd, then changed back to the 14th. It's also known as Candle Mass, like Christmas. This is Candle Mass. The Presentation of the Lord the purification of the Blessed Virgin, and the Feast of the Presentation of Christ in the Temple. So Catholics come along, and they made their religion, and they decided we're going to take all of the pagan holidays and just change the names and, and pretend they're Christian now. And yet they're still doing some of the same practices. Only now they're claiming, well, we're purifying Mary instead of women purifying themselves by sacrifice. Uh, it was not until AD 496 that the church at Rome was able to do anything about Lupercalia. Powerless to get rid of it, Pope Gelasius instead changed it from February 15th to the 14th and called it St. Valentine's Day. It was named after one of the church's saints who uh, in 270 was executed by the emperor for his beliefs. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, at least three different St. Valentines, all of them martyrs, are mentioned. And you can read a lot more there. Uh, the church whitewashed Lupercalia even further. Instead of putting the names of the girls into a box, the names of saints were drawn by both boys and girls. It was then each person's duty to emulate the life of the saint whose name he or she had drawn. This was Rome's vain attempt to whitewash a pagan observance by Christianizing it, which God had not given man the power or authority to do. Though the church at Rome had banned the sexual lottery, young men still practiced a much toned-down version, sending women whom they desired handwritten romantic messages containing St. Valentine's name. Over the century, St. Valentine's Day cards became popular. Especially by the late 18th and early 19th century, these cards were printed with pictures of Cupid and hearts and meticulously decorated with lace, silk, or flowers. And that's one thing that I did when I was in school. As a child in elementary school and even in middle school, I remember they, they made us give away Valentine's Day cards. And I always hated that. I didn't want to do that. I always thought that's so dumb. And now looking back on it, and knowing what I know now, that, that chaps my hide. That makes me so angry that this secular school was making us do something that goes all the way back to pagan evil and pagan roots. It just makes me so mad. Well, let me read you this here. But that's how we get our modern day uh, Valentine's Day cards. You know, will you be my Valentine? What are you saying? Will you sleep with me? If you take it back to its roots, that's what it's all about. Now, I know today we, we are so innocent, aren't we? We think, oh, would you be my valentine? Would you, would you just love me? But that's not where it came from. It came from, would you get drunk and sleep with me? As we smear blood all over our bodies and worship Satan. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. Valentine greetings were popular as far back as the Middle Ages, though written valentines didn't begin to appear until after 1400. The oldest known valentine still in existence today was a poem written in 1415 by Charles, Duke of Orleans, to his wife while he was imprisoned in the Tower of London following his capture at the Battle of Agincourt. The greeting is now part of the manuscript correction of the British Library in London. Several years later, it is believed that King Henry V hired a writer named John Led Ledgate Lightgate composed a Valentine note to Catherine of Valois. In addition to the United States, Valentine Day is celebrated in Canada, Mexico, the United Kingdom, France, and Australia. And on and on and on. And it, it continues to talk about the cards and everything else. Um, Americans probably began ex exchanging handmade Valentines in the early 1700s. In the 1840s, Esther A. Howland began selling the first mass-produced Valentines in America. 
Howland, known as the mother of the Valentine, made into elaborate creations with real lace, ribbons, and colorful pictures known as scrap. Today, according to the Greeting Card Association, there are an estimated 145 million Valentine's Day cards sent each year. So that's how the Catholic Church has taken this old pagan practice of satanic worshiping the devil with blood smeared all over you while you're drunk and naked and fornicating and tried to turn it into Christian. And I want to close with this. The thing that I don't like about this is the commercialization of this. Many of these holidays that are all pagan in origin. They don't come from God in the Bible. They come from ancient Rome and worshiping Satan and false gods. And they all tend to commercialization. What is uh, Christmas? All about buying gifts. All about buying the right tree. All about this and that and the other thing. And all about buying, 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 buying. How about Easter? Oh, buy a chocolate bunny on Easter. Now, my wife will buy me the little... Um, Cadbury cream eggs. Now, I love those. <laughs> and I don't like to eat a lot. I'm not big on sugars, but she'll buy the little bite-sized one, hide them around the office. And uh, what a blessing that is when Easter comes, you know. But they have nothing to do with Christianity. Eggs and things like that. It's all about buy, buy, buy. Halloween, it's all about buy this, buy that, buy, buy a pumpkin for, you know, this. It's all commercialized. And today, what do you see? Well, you get over there and you go into Walmart or one of these stores and you see all these bags of these little hearts and they say be mine heart you you know uh, will you be mine and you buy these little candied hearts and so it's all about candies it's all about chocolates it's all about money 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 and the devil loves it because they're still celebrating him on the day that they used to worship him. They may not be doing a lot of the same things they did, but they're honoring the day that was a day for the devil. Valentine's Day is a billion dollar industry. According to market research from IBS World, Valentine's Day sales reached $17.6 billion last year and should probably reach up to expected sales of $18.6 billion this year. That's a lot of money. So this thing is big business this Valentine's Day. I hope I didn't run it for you. I just want you to know where it comes from. Let me show you something here. This is something my daughter gave me this morning when I woke up. Happy Valentine's Day, Daddy. And oh, I just, oh, that's so sweet. She's only 10 years old. She doesn't know. I love you so, so much, Daddy, it says. And that's a blessing. She lives in this world and, you know, she hears things and she doesn't know. It says Mom and Dad, so it's for both of us. So she doesn't know any better. I'm sure my daughter doesn't know any of this stuff that I told you today. All she thinks, because she's so nice and innocent, is it's just a day to remember to love somebody, and I love my parents. And that's wonderful. I love when it comes around, because I like to you know, do something special for my wife. But you know, thinking about it, every day should be Valentine's Day when you're married. <laughs> Why would you whittle it down to just one day out of the year? So I hope I haven't read this for you, but I wanted you to see this. I thought it'd be good for you to know that a lot of the stuff that the world does comes from evil. And the Bible tells us we're in the world, but not to be of the world. And God is love, and we should always think about Him. I do not want the blood of a goat smeared all over me. That's not how I'm saved. And yet that's how they, these pagans, did their rituals. That blood won't save you. The Bible says in Romans 3.25 that salvation is by faith in the blood of Jesus. Whose blood is that? Acts 20.28 20, says that's God's blood. The Gospel is 1 Corinthians 15.1-4. It's how that Christ died for our sins. When I think of Valentine's Day, I think of love. That's what they want you to think about today with all the hearts and everything. But the love that I see is not the love of the devil, which unfortunately many people have. They love Satan. Oh, don't you know these pagans loved it when this came around every year because it was an excuse to fornicate? That's a sad thing. I'm going to think about it as love for my family, love for my Savior, love what He's done for me. And I want to see people get saved.
So I pray you get saved. If you're not saved, come to Jesus and be saved today. He died on the cross for your sins. What will you do with him? So there's my Valentine's Day sermon. I hope, as I say, it's a blessing to you. I hope you take it and, and understand that a lot of things this world pushes, they push because there's a reason. It comes from evil. And we need to go towards good and not towards evil. So have a good day. Thank you for watching. God bless.